we have the, the last session, and um, you know, it's, it's fairly non-controversial. It's all fairly straightforward. I think we know it all, <laughs> or not. I hope that this will be a session that is, is both informative and challenging. I'm sure it will be. This is something that it makes me think of the words um, overwhelmed, delayed, limited. And I could be talking about people returning to their seats, but I'm actually <laughs> talking about the international response to Ebola. And I think, as we heard in the last session, how it's not just Ebola, but it's about how we support health systems in troubling times, and from Jeremy's talk, how we think beyond just a disease in one place, but how we think about how we tackle these difficult problems um, on, a, on a global scale. Just uh, it, earlier this week, there was a publication in the New England Journal just looking at uh, a, a case report of uh, uveitis uh, occurring um, with confirmed Ebola in one of the healthcare workers nine weeks after viral clearance. This has been reported before, but it just underlines how little we actually know about the pathophysiology of this disease and how best to, to tackle it. And I think we have much to learn. And to help us in that direction, we're greatly um, going to be guided by uh, John Edmonds, who's currently a professor of the Infectious Diseases Modelling uh, team at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Dean of the Faculty of Epidemiology and Population Health. So I'd invite uh, John to uh, chair the next session. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, thank you very much for having me. I feel rather humbled, actually, to be here. Um, as a sort of mathematical modeler, my knowledge of Ebola is uh, really very theoretical, and I'm in front of a crowd of people who know far more about all the practicalities of controlling and treating uh, this dreadful disease. Um, so we've got the way that this session is going to work is that the, we've got uh, four or five speakers um, first up who are going to have uh, give a more of a sort of traditional talk, 10-minute talk, and a, uh, a few minutes for questions afterwards um, on various aspects uh, of the Ebola response and MSF's role in that. Um, and then after that, we've got a panel discussion. So in the questions after the speakers' talks, if you could keep yourself to the speakers' talk, that would be good. Um, uh, and uh, if wider questions, we'll, we'll put to the panel at the end. Um, so first up, we have Umberto, uh, who's, going, who's an anthropologist from, um, uh, from MSF in Belgium, and uh, is gonna, has a really va rather um, uh, stimulating title about state-enforced Ebola containment measures and so on. So Umberto, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, John, and <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. As a, an anthropologist working for a, a medical humanitarian organization, I feel that my uh, scientific work is to give voices to the communities uh, and to translate some apparently obscure social dynamics for uh, improving the healthcare. And I think that this is even much more important during an uh, Ebola outbreak that has completely devastated the social fabric of the West Africans and also their health. With my presentation uh, uh, today, I'm proposing a sociocultural analysis of outbreak containment measures in Liberia. Uh, what I will present are the social consequences of these measures that had on Liberian communities, social consequences that endangered both the outbreak control and the health-seeking behaviors of the population. Um, as it is known, in uh, August 2014, um, the government of Liberia decided, together with international partners, uh, for the implementation of two main emergency measures to control the transmission. The first one was a mandatory cremation of bodies positive to Ebola or highly suspected. And the second one was quarantine of asymptomatic individuals, contacts of positive cases. Such measures were quickly implemented because they were believed to be the fastest ways to curtail an uncontrolled transmission. Cremation was replaced only in December 2014 with dignified burials, while quarantine continued until the end of the outbreak. Now, these measures triggered controversial debates, both internally within the communities in Liberia and externally in the NGOs and international actors. 
Existing literature, especially on quarantine, focus mainly on health aspects and ethical dimensions. For MSF OCB operations during the Ebola outbreak, the qualitative study I'm presenting today, based on an anthropological analysis, was proposed to understand which perceptions people had about these containment measures and how they behaved accordingly. About methodology, methodology was ethnographic, aimed to understand local perceptions and social practices. I have personally carried out um, participant observation with the help of two local assistants in eight areas in Monrovia and seven villages in Grand Cape Mount County. Um, moreover, focus group discussions and individual qualitative interviews have been also realized, grasping all social strata of Liberian population. The location of the research has been selected according to different criteria, uh, number of active cases per area, socio-demographic dimensions, for example, the presence of a market or not, rural urban differences. The data collected have been analyzed thanks to a social and medical anthropological lens by triangulating different uh, uh, sources, places, and data collection proceeds. Uh, as results of my research, I would like to give voices, as I said, to the people I've interviewed with some quotes. I will start with cremation, with mandatory cremation. Uh, the research shows that mandatory cremation was not accepted by the communities in Liberia. At the beginning, and it is important to stress, Liberians understood the need of the cremation. But in the long term, the opinion changed, and changed quite radically. Cremation insulted the local meaning of funeral, and people, in the long run, felt the need of it, with all its complex social and economic significances. As the first um, person uh, interviewed said, Ebola first kills and then steals. With this, the informant means how cremation took away the last chance for the family to be with their relative. Moreover, as the second quote shows, the messages that um, uh, accompanied the mandatory cremation were I can say uh, a bit problematic. Ebola kills, Ebola kills, say the second informant. People got convinced that if they had to die anyway, they would prefer to die at home in their familiar environment. Mandatory cremation raised as well social inequalities. And this is for me a very much important point. What I mean is that uh, those who could afford to bribe, to pay the burial teams, were able to obtain the body of their relative back for private burial in private cemeteries. Of course, those who couldn't bribe for economical reason couldn't have their body back, and they were forced to send it to the crematorium. <coughs> Second point is the quarantine. People perceived that the state imposed the quarantine as a sort of mechanism of social breakdown, in the same way the virus of Ebola was. People felt abandoned, stigmatized, and labeled as Ebola people, as they said. People lacked support and felt pushed away. They witnessed the police block, like in the picture I'm presenting to you, and constrictions of movement without full explanation of the reasons. People under quarantine explain how only sporadically they received food and other important items. This created a social insecurity with people escaping, denying, and hiding. Reaching the conclusion of, the, of this research, a first one informs, in my view, of the differences between the meanings uh, the aid agencies give to containment measures in an outbreak, from one hand, and the meanings the population give to this from the other. In Liberia, the quarantine and the mandatory cremation have been, have been perceived much more than simple, to say, outbreak control measures. They were framed into an historical background of social violence rooted in war and disenfranchisement. I'm showing to you a couple of pictures 
The one on the right presents the um, problematic awareness campaign that's accompanied these measures. Uh, and the second one shows a um, self-organized uh, activity by the local leaders in the community. Well, in my view, it shows the difference between scaring people and involving them. Second conclusion is connected to fear and stigma that these measures have produced and that have prevented um, a fair access to health care and an understanding of the crisis. Cremation and quarantine as vertical public health measures basically do not involve the publics, contributing to the social insecurity, as I said. <laughs> On the contrary, measures that foresee the involvement of the communities as a strategic since the beginning of the outbreak, for example, by placing health promoters side by side with local leaders and contact tracers, show to be more respectful and uh, sustainable in the long term. For the MSF actions, the benefits or the lessons that can be taken from this research um, are basically to consider a community-based approach since the beginning of the epidemic, as I said, by activating outreach activities alongside with clinics and treatment units. Another suggestion that maybe it's a bit uh, a dream is to, to have a field operative research unit composed by epidemiologists and anthropologists as well that can support with data the medical coordination and the advocacy units, monitoring social dynamics and adjusting the intervention accordingly. I would like to thank all the participants to this uh, research and those that have supported me in this activity. And thank you very much to you. Thanks, Roberto. Thanks for a very stimulating talk and for keeping to time. So, um, OK, so over to the audience for questions. And we've got online questions. I have a question from Anas Alamudi, um, who's an MSF logistician and student nurse, who's asking, how effective was state-enforced um, Ebola containment in Liberia? It was effective socially, uh, not really, from my point of view, because it has produced, uh, as I said, a lot of fear and uh, stigma that, has, uh, that have endangered uh, the control of the epidemic itself. C can I ask a follow-up? Um, yeah. uh, 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 did you observe changes over time? I mean, mm -hmm. did, 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 did the population become more compliant with the public health measures? And did the public health measures become more flexible and move towards the population? I actually have seen a sort of a, a movement like the uh, epidemiological graph that sometimes I see with my colleagues. In some cases, the motivation uh, got higher, but in, in other, very low. The social dynamics are very flexible. Uh, but overall, what I can say is that uh, these social dynamics that uh, were not accepting um, these vertical containment measures uh, were a sort of resistance to this, that have not been listened to much. Quarantine continued at the, until the end of the epidemic, despite the fact that people were not really accepting it. Mm. Yes. So can we have a microphone now? And uh, remember to say your name as well. Hi, I'm David from Care International. Um, there's a lot of criticism about um, state-imposed quarantines and restriction of mobilities and and uh, safe burial practices. But in the situations like Ebola, like the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, what other options are there? other than they impose quarantines, et cetera, even if it means taking away some of the, the, um, the human right issues uh, involved in, in these restrictions, um, in your opinions. Um, how do you respond to the criticisms and if there is another option in, a, in terms of a public health um, um, action? Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's a very big question, of course, that involves a lot of aspects. I mean, as a, medical anthropologists, what I can say is that uh, the communities and the people have much more um, resources that sometimes we, uh, we think we expect. And uh, 
if, uh, as I try to say, uh, we involve them since the beginning, uh, for example, with uh, clear, fair, and participative awareness messages that explain what is the crisis about, and don't just say it kills, or it does, or it does not, it's the first step. Then MSF uh, has tried, and uh, I think in some cases quite successfully, to work together with the communities, not only with the local leaders, the so-called local leaders or religious leaders, but even with people, with normal people, market women, for example, taxi drivers, but also the health workers that were working in our facilities. These are uh, citizens of Liberia or, or the other uh, countries. So uh, I don't know if it's a solution, but I have also read in the literature in public health that the, involve, the real involvement of the communities is a key factor and a key lesson to, to learn and to uh, implement. One last question. For, uh, so, lady in the uh, middle. Sorry. Oh, sorry, there's a lady at the back with a microphone. So, yeah. Hi, I'm um, Margaret Fitzgerald from Dublin, and I arrived in Monrovia the day the quarantine started. And there was a huge, I was with Gore and WHO, there was a huge sense of shock at the uh, imposition of quarantine. And you said, where was the public in that public health measure? Where was the health in the public health measure? Because I didn't meet anyone who thought that was justified on health grounds. It was imposed by the president, by our understanding. Um, and I think I agree with you that the key to the relative success in Liberia has been the community. And, um, and but, but that means, as you said, the messages keep need to be adjusted and to the changing circumstances, because definitely cremation was very important in, 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 in stopping the escalation of the outbreak in Monrovia City, and Pierre Fomenti um, was very instrumental, and perhaps they didn't keep an eye on the cultural aspects. Yeah. <laughs> you can make it very quick. Sorry. Thank you. I'm um, Aileen Kitching from uh, Public Health England. I've just recently returned from Sierra Leone. I was working with WHO. It's a question about burials. Um, you suggested, or perhaps I've interpreted from your presentation, that cremation was not accepted, but that burials were a preferred approach, which would be very different to um, the experience in a lot of Sierra Leone, where uh, many communities were very resistant um, to the safe and dignified bur burials and preferred to bury their own death, dead. Um, could you talk a little bit about that in, uh, in Liberia um, and the acceptance of the community towards um, the burial teams? <laughs> okay. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, the burials and the funerals um, uh, performances or practices um, are very different according to the locations, to the ethnic groups, the, to the religion. So um, it's difficult to, to talk in general. Um, what I, I can say quickly is that when I arrived uh, um, in, in, in Morovia in, in, uh, at the end of September, so quite at the peak of the epidemic, I remember that I was requested to monitor the, the Muslim community in Morovia because uh, the fear was that they were performing uh, traditional burials. It was on the media as well, in, in I mean, newspapers. Uh, well, the, the same day I read on a, a local newspaper in Morovia that one of the most uh, important and influent imam in Morovia was uh, uh, publishing a, a, an article on the newspaper saying, uh, we, the, the, the Muslim community, we have modified our practices uh, to better respond to the outbreak and to uh, avoid the transmission. And uh, it was quite interesting for me because there was this idea that the, the Muslims were uh, not, uh, you know, uh, complying with uh, the uh, proceeds, but actually they were, uh, yeah, cremation, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I, I think we're going to have to move on, sorry. Yeah, I, but, but I think we should thank Umberto, uh, thank once again for a great talk.